Hello everyone. This uh, video is recorded in the last week of October, uh, just uh, less than two weeks before the uh, presidential election in the United States. And it seems that everything is on hold uh, to see the outcome of this election. It has been a, a very contentious campaign, you might say. Uh, the, the United States, the people of the United States have never been more divided. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. Uh, it is not totally out of the question that uh, the United States could plunge into civil war. And I believe it will, based primarily upon what I read in the prophecies. In fact, there was a thread on my uh, forum, Civil War Updates, <laughs> which I started some months ago that kind of uh, relates some of the uh, things that could lead up to a uh, bloody civil war. Well, I don't, I don't know, you know, how, how this thing will turn out. It seems that the last election, there was a lot of um, fraud involved. And I, I, I'm not sure if they'll be able to do that this time, though, because there's a lot more people that are watching. Like I say, I don't know. It is possible that uh, if Donald Trump wins, uh, the present administration would still be in power until the transfer in January. And so, uh, you know, anything could happen. It seems that the United States uh, administration has asked Ukraine uh, to, to hold back on their uh, efforts to direct, you know, directly uh, hit deep into Russia. And Israel has been asked as well to uh, not attack Iran. And they did the other day, but it, apparently everything was shot down. Uh, so they don't want a big blow up before <laughs> the election. Uh, that might not be the same after the election if they don't get the outcome that they desire. You know, there's a troubling uh, law, I don't know if you call it a law or an executive order, that uh, has been issued just a few months ago that give the United States military the authority to shoot and kill American citizens. I mean, when you have the army uh, turning on the citizens, then that, that is a civil war. And uh, why would they do that unless they are anticipating uh, civil unrest, unless they're going to create it? Well, the reason this is interesting to me, that's putting it mildly, I expect, you know, it's been 2,000 years nearly since Jesus left this earth. And he told his apostles that he was going away to prepare a place for them, but that he was returning, that he could take his disciples and uh, bring them to the place that he's prepared for them in heaven. So the return of Jesus is uh, a big deal uh, and an event like no other. Jehovah's Witnesses, however, <laughs> believe that Jesus has already returned. Jehovah's Witnesses actually believe that the second coming is history. The second coming occurred in 1914. And although the Watchtower doesn't use that expression, the second coming, if you search hard enough, you'll find that they say, the second coming occurred in 1914, and most people do not see the sign. 
And of course, the sign was nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, World War I. And the Watchtower is saying that there can be no other war and other events, you know, food shortages, pestilence. That was it back then. There cannot be another. But of course, there can be. Dogma cannot prevent a World War III from breaking out. And, you know, people are talking about it. That if, I mean, there are a couple of flashpoints right now, Ukraine and, and Russia, Russia's warning, if you strike deep into Russia with NATO weapons, we will consider it an act of war and it will be World War III. Same thing with Israel attacking Iran. Iran has the power to completely obliterate Israel. And of course, Israel is a nuclear power. But Iran can throw together a nuclear bomb in a couple of weeks, they say. And besides, uh, Pakistan has allied with Iran, and Pakistan is a nuclear power. So we've got all the sides taken up here. NATO with France and Great Britain and the United States, they're all nuclear powers. And then we have Russia, China, India is kind of in the middle there. We don't know what they're going to do. But it just takes one incident. I mean, World War I started from one assassination of one individual. And because of the alliances, just like it is now with NATO, if one NATO country is attacked, they're all obligated to join in the fray. So it's a mess. And I believe World War III is inevitable and imminent. And it will signal the second coming of Christ. Well, God has to, you know, like I say, it's been 2,000 years, and there is a point in time when God will insert himself. Uh, to be sure, Jesus. But Jesus comes in the name of Jehovah. Jesus has been given all authority. He's been given almighty power to rule in Jehovah's behalf. Well, one of the first things that Jesus will do when he comes as a thief in the night is to judge those who are part of God's household. Judgment begins with the house of God, says in the letter of Peter. So Jehovah's Witnesses claim to be the true religion. They even um, have an institution that's called the house of God. That's Bethel. In Hebrew, Beth El. Beth is house. El is short for Elohim, the house of God. And so the headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses is Bethel. So what will... <laughs> What will become of this house of God when Christ comes to initiate judgment? Well, all the prophets speak about this, and one of those prophets is Amos. You know, I've written a book, Jehovah Himself Has Become King, and uh, I go through many of the prophets uh, the minor ones, especially the, the major prophets were too long. The book would have been a couple thousand pages. But I have commentaries on the major prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, on my website, E Watchman. But in the book, there's a chapter called Amos. Amos and Obadiah, I combine them. But uh, So I go through chapter by chapter, basically. But the fifth chapter, Jehovah talks about Bethel. He said when King Solomon became an apostate and 
even though Jehovah had appeared to him twice, and he was privileged to write a good portion of the Bible, actually, uh, he didn't listen to Jehovah. And, uh, you know, God specifically told him not to multiply wives and not foreign wives for sure. Uh, but he ended up with, what, 600 wives and 300 concubines, and he ended up building temples for the gods that his wives worshipped. And as a result, Jehovah caused a, a split in the kingdom. Ten tribes uh, were given to Jeroboam, and only two tribes stayed at Jerusalem, Judah and, and Benjamin. But Jerusalem was still the center for true worship, and that's where the temple was. But Jeroboam, fearing that the kingdom might be reunited, uh, set up a couple of uh, worship centers, and one was at Bethel, where he set up a golden calf for their convenience, so they didn't have to travel all the way uh, to Jerusalem to worship. So Bethel was uh, a prominent city. Well, anyway, in Amos chapter 5, Jehovah tells the house of Israel, search for me and keep living. Do not search for Bethel and do not go to Gilgal or pass over to Beersheba for Gilgal will certainly go into exile and Bethel will come to nothing. Search for Jehovah and keep living so that he does not burst out like a fire on the house of Joseph, consuming Bethel with, with no one to extinguish it. Well, why would God destroy his own organization? Well, it should be apparent because they rebelled against him and they indulged in this idolatry. And verse 7 says, You turn justice into wormwood and you cast righteousness to the earth. I went to some length in the chapter on Amos to show that the Watchtower has done that very thing by their inability to protect children from child predators. And it's bad enough that thousands, tens of thousands of children of Jehovah's Witnesses have been sexually abused, but the Watchtower's policies protect the pedophile. It was considered a reproach that, you know, we have to keep this crime, uh, you know, hush, hush. Elders were instructed, for example, when they get a report of a child being abused, to pick up the phone and call Bethel, Bethel's legal department. And they would determine their advice based in, in the United States uh, based upon whether or not the state in which the crime took place required clergymen to report a crime such as sexual abuse. And if it wasn't required, the elders were ordered by Bethel not to contact the police, not to cooperate with them in any way. Uh, parents of the victim were ordered not to contact the police. Throwing righteousness to the earth, turning justice into wormwood, what could, how much, <laughs> how much worse could you handle it? Just imagine if Bethel would have had a policy. When you hear of a child being abused, don't call us, call the police. Get the police involved. Have this accused pedophile interrogated by the police. Don't you think that would act at least as a deterrent to someone else thinking that 
They can abuse a child and not face punishment. You know, it's rightly been said that the Watchtower is a pedophile's paradise. How could it be otherwise? How can Bethel have 23,000 names of known pedophiles on file and claim that there's not a problem with pedophilia. So Jehovah will demand punishment for this. And it's interesting that he says, do not search for Bethel. Because Bethel claims to have all the answers. They are Jehovah's spokesmen. No one else can know anything. <laughs> it, it, um, it's interesting what, in verse 5 where it says um, Bethel will come to nothing. There's a little asterisk there. And uh, the older reference, New World Translation, said Bethel will become something uncanny. Now it says Bethel will come to nothing. But... Uh, Bethel will become something uncanny. You know, the Watchtower has another problem other than uh, the way they've coddled pedophiles. And you know, Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, now the Watchtower doesn't do that anymore. They've changed their policy. Okay, well, that's true. That's true. But what about the tens of thousands of children that have been abused? and in large part because of the policies that protect pedophiles. How about compensation for them? How about an apology? Wouldn't that be the right thing to do instead of hush money that they can't even speak about the crimes that have been committed against them? <laughs> you know, Jesus forewarned that when he comes, that there will be many false prophets and false Christs that will arise and mislead many. In fact, Jesus said that some will say that here is the Christ in the wilderness. Here he is in the inner chambers. And Jesus said it would be so convincing, so authentic, that if possible, even the chosen ones would be deceived. So we're talking something uncanny, some demonic voice pretending to be the voice of Jehovah, because that's what the Watchtower claims to be, the spokesman for Jehovah. But when Christ comes, why would we need an organization like the Watchtower? When Jesus comes, he will have all authority. He will be king. The preaching work will end. Why will we need a publishing company? But Jehovah's Witnesses have been conditioned by the Watchtower to expect to receive life-saving information during the dark days ahead. Well... That's not going to happen, my friends. If we go, go on down to uh, uh, let me ask you a question. How many days of Jehovah are there? You know, most of the prophets spoke of the day of Jehovah. Well, there's only one day of Jehovah, right? But it mentions it here in Amos. My, my little, <laughs> I just flipped the page here. Hold on, hold on. I need a new iPad. All right. You, you still there? Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, Verse 18, woe to those who yearn for the day of Jehovah. 
Isn't that Jehovah's Witnesses? Jehovah's Witnesses are looking forward to the day of Jehovah. Right? Who else is looking forward to the day of Jehovah? Only Jehovah's Witnesses. But why will it be woe for them? What then will the day of Jehovah mean for you? You who yearn for it. It will be darkness and not light. It will be like a man who flees from a lion and is confronted by a bear. And when he enters his house and leans his hand against the wall, a snake bites him. Will not the day of Jehovah be darkness and not light? Will it not have gloom and not brightness? Well, why is that? As I say, there's only one day of Jehovah, and it begins when Christ Jesus returns. Paul used the expression, the day of the Lord. Revelation talks about the Lord's day. Uh, the Watchtower says the Lord's day began in 1914, but the day of Jehovah is in the future. But in reality, they're the same day. And the Lord's day has not begun. And all of the things that the Watchtower said have been fulfilled in prophecy, beginning in 1914 and on and on, the death stroke of the beast and, and all of that, none of it has occurred. But yet, all of Jehovah's Witnesses are required to believe that. So, when the day of Jehovah begins, things will not transpire as Jehovah's Witnesses have been led to believe. And that's why it will be a time of darkness and not light. So, <laughs> it's interesting. Jehovah goes on here and says, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no pleasure in the aroma of your solemn assemblies. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses are known for their conventions and assemblies, are they not? And Jehovah says he's, he's tired of it all. Verse 23, Spare me the din of your songs, and let me not hear the melodies of your stringed instruments. Let justice flow down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. If you want to worship Jehovah, you have to do it in righteousness. And uh, the Watchtower has not been able to do that. In fact, they become worse and worse and worse. So, in, ch in chapter 7, Amos was confronted by the priests of Bethel, wasn't a Levitical priest, by the way. And uh, he was sent by the king to go confront Amos. He told the king that Amos was conspiring against you. And we said, we can't put up with your words. As for this is what Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go away into exile. Well, I've been telling the Watchtower for about 20 years that uh, it's going to collapse. And it's not going to be there to issue these life-saving instructions. But Amos responded to Amaziah, this priest of Bethel. He says, I was not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but I was a herdsman. And I took care of sycamore fig trees. I used to be a tree man myself. So. <laughs> but Jehovah took me away from following the flock. And Jehovah said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. So Amos was told he could not prophesy in Israel. Go off, do your prophesying somewhere else. We don't want to hear it. This is the house of a great king. And so Amos went ahead and told them, you're saying, do not prophesy against Israel. Do not preach 
And so he says, therefore, your wife will become a prostitute in the city and your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be apportioned out with a measuring line and you yourself will die in an unclean land. And Israel will surely go into exile from its land. You know, if you go to the, um, the, the last chapter in Amos, and, you know, you, you might be inclined to say, well, that's Israel, that's a primitive setting. And, but the prophecy is to be fulfilled when Christ becomes king. Well, how do we know that? Verse 9 of this last chapter, 9, it says, For look, I'm giving the command, and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations. So the house of Israel is not just a physical location. Members of the house of Israel are in all the nations. Just as one shakes a sieve, and not a pebble falls to the ground. They will die by the sword, all the sinners of my people. Those who are saying, the calamity will not come near us or reach us. So in that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen, and I will repair the breaches, and I will restore its ruins, and I will rebuild it as in the days of long ago, so that they may take possession of what is remaining of Edom, all the nations on whom my name has been called, declares Jehovah. Well, you know, um, when there was a controversy in the uh, Christian congregation in the first century, the Jewish Christians tried to get the Gentile Christians to get circumcised and uh, obey the law of Moses. And it was quite a uh, contentious controversy uh, but the apostles sorted it out and they quoted from this prophecy about people from the nations being called by God's name. But of course, the booth of David that had fallen down was not uh, rebuilt in the first century. It's true Jesus became king, but only over his congregation. So, the real rebuilding of this kingdom is when Christ becomes king, his, his return. And that's when this separating will occur. Jesus gave an illustration of the wheat and the weeds. And he said, during the conclusion, the master of the harvest will send out angels and they will remove the weeds from among the wheat and the wheat will be taken into the storehouse. And he says, then the chosen ones will shine as brightly as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So we haven't seen that separation yet. And the watchtower said, well, yeah, the harvest took place in 1918. Jehovah removed all the false Christians, millions, hundreds of millions of false Christians, part of Christendom. And he, he just left the Bible students. That's their explanation. Uh, but why, why would God need to do that? The international Bible students were already a separate and distinct sect. How did God remove the millions of parishioners from... It, it's false. <laughs> so, but we can expect this harvest to begin when Christ comes. And the sign of his coming is world war. Food shortages, pestilence, and all of that. And it's preceded whenever they're saying peace and security. And the sudden destruction comes upon those saying peace and security, which I expect will be the Anglo-American power. And that's their sudden destruction is the mortal wound upon the head of the beast, which the Watchtower says took place <laughs> in 1950s, 60s. They don't pin it down because obviously the Anglo-American dual world power, the head of the beast, was victorious in the war, and uh, it's, it's a myth. Anyway, 
I'm a little cold out here in the barn today. I didn't get the heater turned on soon enough. So I, I think I'm going to call it quits right there. It'll be interesting to see what uh, happens with the election and afterward. But, uh, you know, I feel like we're right on the edge of something coming undone here in a big way. So anyway, hope to talk to you again. Thanks for watching.